Welcome to the Franchise Woman Podcast, where passion and purpose collide, profits are made, and relationships forged. I'm Rebecca Monet, CEO and Chief Scientist at Zorical Profiles, along with my co-host, community advocate, speaker, author, and entrepreneur, Tracy Kawa. Our special guest today is Andy Fuller, the Chief Hunter at Mosquito Hunters. In my opinion, there is nothing better than a mosquito-free summer. Mosquito Hunters is a 30-plus unit residential and commercial pest control franchise under the Happiness brand's umbrella. The Mosquito Hunters is a recession-resistant franchise concept with a low overhead business model, which allows its owners to keep fixed costs down while they grow their customer base. Please meet Andy Fuller, one of my favorite people to talk philosophy, human behavior, and business ownership with. Andy, welcome. Thanks a lot for having me. It's great to be here. Woohoo! It's about Hi, time we had you on. Oh, yeah. I'm loving it. Andy, I had a look at your LinkedIn profile, and it looked like, I don't know, like a mosquito you just dropped out of the sky right into franchise. There is no point in time defining anything that happened before your life in franchise. So I was a bit curious about it. How how did you come into franchise? I came into franchising as uh, basically a, a frustrated corporate employee who uh, wanted to work with a tribe of small business owners. I didn't really know anything about franchising. Um, I didn't know what it would take to become a franchisor. Um, I just knew that it was small business owners and I love small business owners. And I knew that uh, I wanted to put a dent into America. I wanted to weave, weave some sort of brand into the fabric of America. I wanted to um, just be something much bigger than myself. And I saw franchising at a high level as a pathway to get there. And then kind of the rest was a matter of, of learning the details. Wow. So you, like a lot of small business owners, franchisees, and franchisors, went the corporate route for a while. But was there um, a pivotal moment or that said, okay, the corporate world is not for me. It's time for me to do something uh, else. Yes. So... Uh... I was actually, there was a, a job that I got in corporate America. It was a two year interview process that, that it took me to get this job. Oh my goodness. Tr- tried a long time, went through different uh, profiles and interviews and dinners and I finally got this job. This was a, a long time ago, but I, I got that job. I took a look around and I said, this is it. Like, this is going to be my career now. This is, there's room to grow. Uh, the money's great. I get to travel to interesting places. I get a car allowance. Uh, very uh, liberal expense policy with this company, like everything's great. Um, but then after about a year, I took a look around and I thought, I I hate this. I hate every part of this. I hated the politics and you know how everyone's objective seemed to be just get work off of my desk. W- whatever it is, just get it off of my desk. Like the worst thing you could ever do is make a mistake. Everyone was so unwilling to just try things because then you could, you could be wrong. And if you're wrong, then everyone's going to mm-hmm. point at you and, and judge you. Like that was, that was the culture overall. And that was really frustrating. I came in with a certain kind of naivete because I, I in college, like I, I paid for my college by painting houses and I sort of accidentally fell in love with small business by doing that. And I really thought, honestly, going into this company, like, we can build so many things because there's all these resources that we'll have our, at our disposal. There's so much money going around at this company. Like we could do anything. We could build anything. We can collaborate and we can innovate. Like the sky is the limit. And I came to realize that that's just not what culture is like in corporate America. Uh, it's it's a very, ri- very risk averse culture. And I found, I found that to be um, uninspiring, I guess, for lack of a better word. But really, you know, what was the nail in the coffin for me that that kind of aha moment where it was just like, all right, that's it. Like I need to find my way out was I had a boss who I really didn't care for uh, candidly, a pretty conniving and vindictive person. uh, If I'm being totally honest. 
And I, I would come to this boss and say, well, I have an idea how we could make this thing better. Or, or what if we tried this other thing? And I got a lot of, you know, as you would expect, no, like that's not going to work. No, it's fine the way it is. Like, cool it. Just it's fine. It's okay. And I started to see the boss was actually after he would shoot me down, would take my idea and promote it to his bosses and to others uh. it was his own idea. Oh. And then there was one branch meeting that we had where he kind of stood up and did the same thing, but he did it like right in front of me. Oh. And it was, I had gotten frustrated about it before because uh, I I heard about it happening before, but it was, I saw it firsthand and um I wasn't mad about it at that point. Like the feeling that I actually had was just sadness. It was genuinely like, what am I going to do? Like, am I going to spend the next few decades of my life and career, you know, playing corporate politics like this, letting people walk all over me because like, that's just what you're supposed to do. You know, kiss, let's just say kissing the pinky rings is probably the nicer way to put it. You know, I have to kiss, kiss the boss's pinky rings, um, whether or not I agree with them you know, not try to build things, but just try and get my bonus, you know, it, it all, it, you know, by any means necessary. I, I just didn't want to do that. And I, I knew I wanted to do, go back to something with small business owners. That's my tribe. I wanted to work with small business owners. Um, franchising was something that was kind of on my radar. It was something that has always been in the back of my mind. Like, wouldn't it be cool to start a franchise concept and, and work with these business owners and be a part of something bigger than myself. And the rest was a matter of, like I said earlier, just kind of learning the details, but it was really the catalyst was, you know, started with a passion, but it was, it was so bad and so unbearable for me in corporate America. Like that's what gave me that, that extra little push that I needed. Andy, wow. I want to pick your story apart in so many different directions <laughs> right now. I don't know which way to go first. Like, First of all, you as an early entrepreneur, that is so cool. And just, you know, almost like your fight to get back there, right, is, is that theme of your early, early years in corporate. I really truly believe, I mean, even as a career coach, I hear this all the time, that, that there's a person standing in the way of somebody else's success. And you know, at times, yes, it's pervasive throughout the culture and, and we can dive more into that. But I think your story, be, because I hear that so often, I believe your story is going to resonate with so many people on so many levels. I think most pressing for me is a question about that, that madness turned into sadness. Mm. And why one why did the sadness motivate you to leave beyond the madness? And I love the fact that you identified the emotions behind it. I'm just trying to figure out like, what, what was the sadness that did it versus the madness? No one's ever asked me that before. I think, I think the madness was probably driven by this thing like, well, I'm going to beat you. Like, I know you're trying to beat me down right now, but I'm going to come back and I'm going to show you. And then the sadness was realizing, like, this whole game is stupid. Like, the whole game that I've been, like, yeah. that I've been devoting my life to for the past couple of years is just a worthless game. And it's a game that I really, if I'm being honest with myself in that moment, it's like I realized that th I have no interest and no desire to play this game you know, it's not, it's not true, but I, you know, maybe I had this feeling of like, I've been wasting my career. I've been wasting my talent for the past few years here. I should be doing this for myself. Um, yeah. I'd be making more money if I did it for myself. I'm willing to bet on myself and on my skills. And I just wouldn't have to work with people that I don't want to work with. Yeah. You know, so it was, it was this defeated sense of realizing, I think that the game, the game wasn't a game I wanted to play. Wow. You know, it's it's interesting question, uh, Tracy, and, and I like how you answer it, because I do think mad or angry is an emotion that says this is unfair, this is unjust, and it brings up a part of us that tries to bring around some justice. It was unfair what was happening. Here's Andy, you being 
really wired to be an entrepreneur, to be honest. And you had these brilliant ideas that you thought, great, if I share these ideas, this is a company with resources and it's going to benefit them and benefit all of us. So you were bringing out of a, a innovative mind some ideas and it was being stolen and not recognized. That that I think is an injustice. That sadness is they're never going to listen. This, sure. I'm, I'm in a situation that I'm not going to be able to contribute my innovation, my big ideas. This is not just unjust, but this is futile, sure. <laughs> right? It's really kind yeah. of futile in many ways. And that would be kind of a hopeless, sad kind of uh, feeling. And we're each motivated differently. In this case, you said, I, I cannot live like this. You know, I'm, I'm an idea person. I, at the core of who I am, I'm an entrepreneur, and this is not an environment where we can, ex where you could have expressed yourself. So very fascinating. Talk a little bit more, though. So was it just the boss, or was there more going on there where you could finally say, this is just the way it is, I'm out of here? Well, I mean, it, it wasn't just the boss. Uh, it, it'd be one thing. You know, if it were, it's like, okay, this one guy is just a knucklehead and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go somewhere else or this guy will be out of here soon. And then everything will be fine once, once this guy is out of my life. But it was, it was more pervasive than that. It was, it was mm -hmm. cultural. And at first I thought it was, okay, at first I thought, honestly, that was my progression. First I thought, okay, it's just him. Then I looked around and I realized, no, it's actually, this is a culture that enables this kind of behavior. This is the kind of company where a guy like this works here and, not only does he not get fired, he gets promoted to manage people. And he continues this sort of behavior. And, you know, you heard whispers and people knew about what was going on. So it wasn't entirely a secret. And this person still continues to work here. And, and in some cases, you know, gets publicly praised. You know, and I, I took a look up the ladder, so to speak, at people who were higher on the food chain than me. You know, um, and I, there wasn't a single person where I said, Oh, I'd really love to have their job. Oh, that that person that person's doing great. You know, I that that person, uh, I, you know, I, I would really love to be in their shoes. Like, no, it was just different people in a different position trying to protect themselves, trying to avoid work, trying to get their bonus, kissing, trying to figure out what's the right pinky ring to kiss. You know, and I don't see that say that to be, you know, cruel or, or or anything to anybody, but that's that's what I would see myself as if I were in that seat and I just didn't want to be there. Yeah. I just got that vision of like, like somebody in high school going, going back to visit their old buddies that, you know, that weren't kind to them in high school. Like, look at me now, uh, like, you know, like that kind of thing where every knock is a boost, right? Yeah. Because if it wasn't for that negative situation. You would never have like, that was the worst. And then you've created like one of the best. Right. Well, it, and don't get me wrong. Like I still, you know, I, I have friends that are still, there and in that industry and and you know i made friends along the way and i'm grateful for that i just mean culturally structurally that's not how i wanted to to, to spend my career and i'm certainly i'm certainly happy with the the choices that i made you know after that you know trying to take that negative and use it as a catalyst to do what in my heart i knew i wanted to do which is be a small business owner and to work with small business owners that's perfect. You know, some of what you're describing is in Zorka, what we call stage four company, where it becomes more red tape and protecting our role, right, rather than contributing to something bigger. Um, and it and you were just not wired for that. You you got this entrepreneurial side, this idea side. OK, so cool. You made a decision. Did it take a day, a week, a month for you to plot your exit? And how did you go from that to Mosquito Hunters? I mean, you were a painter and had a painting business that puts you through university. But how did you go to this idea? I knew I wanted to get back into home services. I, I tried looking elsewhere, but just nothing really clicked to me in the same way. The part that I loved about home services is that uh, it's it's really high gross margin, generally speaking. And high gross profit margin is great because, of course, the higher your gross profit, the higher potential for a high net profit. But then also that means 
you have some wiggle room to take some big swings and make some mistakes and fall on your face and, and live to tell the tale and iterate and improve. And that's, that's what I'm really passionate about. That's what I love so much about uh, entrepreneurship is uh, being able to be creative and, and take risks and, and try to innovate. I just, even at, you know, at my core, it's not about, you know, even being a business owner. Uh, I just like creating things. I want to build things. That's what really makes me tick as a human being. Um, and so anyway, I like that because that's, you're enabled to do that when you have great mm -hmm. gross profit margins and you can have great gross profit margins in home services. The problem with most home services is that it's sort of a one-time deal and painting is a great example. So if Rebecca or Tracy, if you were to hire me to come to one of your houses to, to paint, I paint, the paint job would be done and you'd be good for a decade or so, which mm -hmm. is great for you as the customer. But for me as the business owner, that means I have to reinvent the wheel mm -hmm. always, always and forever to find new customers. And I wanted to get into a business where I could continue working with the same customers over and over because um, it's great to have those relationships and uh, it's easier to get referrals when you have great relationships. And also it makes for a more valuable business too, just dollars and cents wise. Uh, if you have existing customers that you retain year after year and build upon that base of customers, your business becomes more like an annuity uh, and, and it just increases in value. You can't have that same sort of situation with a non-renewable home service business, which is, which is most home service businesses. I wanted to be in a space that was emerging, something that wasn't overly mature. I, I mean, Rebecca, you know me well. Um, you know, the 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 stage for you know overly developed, overly mature red tape to type industry isn't for me. I wanted to go into an industry where it was kind of more like the wild, wild west mm -hmm. and try and learn how to settle it. And um and and you know, that's all, all of these things. I, I should say there were other things too. It was, uh, I wanted something that was simple, something that was simple enough where I didn't have to go back to school uh, or uh, be an apprentice or work for somebody else's company. Candidly, I just didn't have that kind of patience at that point in time. I was ready to go. I wanted to get started, learn enough to be dangerous within a really short period of time. Uh, I didn't want to be at the mercy of my employees either. So I would have to like, just take their word for it entirely. I wanted to know how to wear every hat in the business to get started. Um, it was something that was interesting, something that provided value to the community, uh, something that, you know, if people ask me, hey, what do you do for a living? It was something that I would enjoy talking about and, uh, you know, wouldn't make my my skin curl. Um, wow. So uh, for all those reasons, yeah, I chose mosquito control, not because of some deep hatred of, of mosquitoes. I mean, I've never really been a huge fan, but uh, it was just because it checked those boxes better than anything else could. We can't tell that you enjoy what you do. Yeah. Wow. I love we it. can't tell that it checks every box. <laughs> yeah. Look at all the boxes. I wrote them all down. Right. I mean, a very distinct set of criteria yes. that Andy used to decide what his next venture was. It needed to be something that was innovative, creative, you know, out of the box, allowed him to take a certain amount of risk. But it also would had to be in home services. It had to be a consumable product that had built this annuity. It had to be one where he wasn't crazy dependent on employees. Uh, it had to be, you know, something that uh, was of value to the community. Boom, 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 boom. All these kinds of criteria. I wish more people thought like you, Andy, and had this very precise criteria that says, this is what I'm looking for. And then go out and create it or find it or partner with someone to to do that. Do you find the prospective franchisees that you're talking to, they know exactly what they're looking for? Or is it more they, you know, happenstance on it? You know, they sort of come across it. It's, yeah, it's funny. I, I don't think I've said this before. I don't think anybody grows up dreaming to be a mosquito hunter. No. Um, <laughs> I, I know I didn't. Uh, I didn't even know it existed. And, and I, what I've heard from a lot of franchisees of ours is uh, a number of them come from the franchise consultant community. And, you know, the consultants will say, well, here's three, four or five brands that I think you, you would really be interested in and talk to these five brands, let's say, and and see which one is the most, has the best fit. And many times I've heard from franchisees, like I, I got this introduction from, from my consultant, you were mosquito hunters was on the list. 
I laughed and I thought, okay, that's at the bottom of the list. And then they started having conversations and start learning about the business and the nuts and bolts. And then mosquito hunters kind of moved up the list and eventually made it to the top. And I chose mosquito hunters because it was the best fit for me, but it, I, I never would have thought when I started down my franchise journey, I would have chose, you know, a mosquito franchise. I, I hear that from franchisees somewhat often. That's amazing. I mean, I would think the same, you know, and as, as someone learns more and more how it does really check all the boxes, boxes that they may not have been conscious about initially, but you brought forward, it's all of a sudden, huh, this is a, this is a business where I'm building equity. I'm active in the community. I have repeat business. It's creating this beautiful uh, annuity. It's a simple business. Shoot, that sounds like a pretty exciting business, right? I can even go to the country club and say, I, you know, I shoot mosquitoes, right? <laughs> right? So and hopefully we also have the country club as a client, right? That's right, the- right. Yeah. Bring some business cards. Here you go. Um, Tracy, if you don't have a question, I want to shift gears to Hunter Palooza, but it sounds like you had a question. You know, I I just actually have a, a point. I really, I just want to make sure our audience hears that Andy loves to, or he wanted to go into the Wild West and put a dent in yeah. the national fabric of America. I just need to punctuate that, accentuate it, and you can ask your question because that to me is like, Wow, fascinating. That is fascinating that that you are more of that starter individual, the wild, wild west, rather than someone that wants to be part of a massive situation where you couldn't um, implement your ideas or even be applauded for taking risks. So, But I want to shift gears. I was just recently reading about your Hunter Palooza that you guys did with your franchisees. Tell us more about that and what came out of it. Hunter Palooza. Actually, I've got a, a t-shirt right here. I don't know if, uh, if everybody, oh, be able to, you want to see the t-shirt? Yeah, yeah I, I want to see it. it. This is like a rare find now. We, we ran out of these, but I've got one. Hunter, Hunter Palooza. Palooza. I love yeah. it. So these are. I love our table. mascot. He's cool. Very cute. It was, this is adorable. Look at the walrus behind there with the sunglasses. <laughs> oh, and then this is the back too. We did it like concert style with all the events. Oh, that's neat. That's cool. What yeah. a great idea. Sure. So it, it was something that was long overdue. We uh, We wanted to get together years ago and it was our first ever conference where we got all of our franchisees together. We really hit our stride with franchisees, with, with building the, the franchise system and getting enough franchisees where we could even really have a viable conference. That was about 2019. And we got to the end of 2019. And I thought, okay, we finally have enough people under the tent. We have enough franchisees here. We can have a conference next year, 2020. That's going to be the year. And of yeah. course, 2020 came and that didn't happen. Uh, we and It didn't happen in 2021 and it didn't happen in 2022. And finally, in 2023, we got everybody together. And, you know, I can't even say it's a lesson because if we could have, we would have had everyone together. But I mean, for lack of a better way of putting it, it's like we're a great case study of the importance of human connection in business, the importance of getting people together. And it was just a learning that there's just no substitute for getting together. I mean, we had so many we tried to fill in that void as best as we could. Like I'm sure so many other, every company did, you know, having Zooms and and uh, email updates and creating videos, cell phone videos, and just sharing sharing ideas and, and um, challenges as best as we could. We even had a, a magazine that we were using, you know, magazines uh, kind of highlighting franchisees and their successes and struggles, et cetera. But all of those things, just pale so much in comparison to just something as simple as getting everybody together in the same room for three and a half days, uh, do talk some business during the day, have some fun at night, break bread, have some drinks, do some activities. We did a charity, charitable activity. We, we did a food packing event, meal packing event that impacted 800 families in the Tampa community. 
Uh, the dinner cruise uh, on Tampa Bay was like amazing. There's, n- I've never done anything like that. It was so cool. We, we went to a Tampa Bay Lightning game. Uh, a group went to go see Hamilton because Hamilton, the play, was there in town. It was, uh, it was something really special. And so then on the heels of that, it was so good. I was like, we kind of need to follow the, follow this up with a chaser. So we did the scaling summits, which we were calling. We did those in February, and we just had our final scaling summit earlier this week in March. And uh, we did one in New Jersey, brought in a bunch of franchisees from that region. We did one in Illinois, where I live, brought in a bunch of franchisees from the Midwest. And then the one we just did was in Dallas, Fort Worth, and brought in a bunch of franchisees from, from the South that came in from all over. And, and just focusing on some of the key initiatives this year, key strategies, make sure we execute, uh, making sure you're building your team, making sure you're following up with your leads and ways to upsell, et cetera, et cetera. But, but also just we, each one of these events take some time to just hang out. Like mm-hmm. what, we did, what we did at this last one, it was so simple. Like at first we were thinking, well, if we're going to get everybody together, let's let's go out to eat somewhere or let's go to a Dave and Buster's or something. Let's do something fun, some activity. And I thought, you know what? Let's just get the presidential suite at the hotel, get a really big room where there's some tables and some couches and let's just get some board games and some pizzas and some beers and let's just hang out. Let's just hang out all night. And we did. And it was a, a riot. Everyone had such a great time. Uh, just so simple. And, and I guess I would share that to any franchisors or franchisees who are, are watching this or listening to this is like the simpler, the better. Mm-hmm. But so much gets solved just by little things like that, where you can just talk to each other and hang out with each other like people. That That's the part that you just cannot get on Zoom is the little uh, the little small talk, the little, you know, BSing, if you will, you know, the stuff that you're that you do in between the meetings talk about the family and talk about some movie that somebody saw or, oh, this crazy thing happened to me in the Uber on the way here. You wouldn't believe like, those are the things that really are the glue in a relationship. So it was, it was so great to be able to experience that over the past, you know, six weeks or so. That is so neat how you almost recreated your college business days by having like pizza and beer and everybody just hanging out and, and everybody in that room with like a common goal and a common culture and understanding the culture of the company and having this unity, that must have been a really amazing experience. Because even like going out to a restaurant, you know, you're still waiting in line, you're still losing time, you're still, there's so much external noise, there's still the time taken to ordering and looking at the menu. And, and those are just some of the basic things. So what I'm saying is you don't realize how much time you actually gain by having such an informal yet formal, like formal, right. but yet informal get together. Right, right. Well, and then you get seated at your table at the restaurant and you can only talk to at most, you know, six, side, eight side people. Across. Yeah. Right. And, you know, as far as you can yell, basically. But then anyone else who's sitting other over at some other end of the long table or some yeah. other table in the room, you never really get a chance to chat. But this, you know, the un- informal thing really helped to that end because everybody just kind of walked around and, hey, I'll play this game here, play left, right, center, or play Jenga or something. And then when I'm done with that, I'm going to go talk to that guy and this gal over here. And it seemed to help a lot to that end. Well, we love Jenga. You know, we love Jenga. That's love right. some Jenga. I saw that. <laughs> but, but, also, but, but also, it's a more relaxed environment. You know, they everybody can just let their hair down. Kudos to you for figuring that out. Something yeah, so I mean, simple yet impactful. It, it, it wasn't uh, strictly me coming up with that. I want to give credit to to our team and, and to franchisees for sharing ideas on how to do it. But now that I've done it, like I can't go back. I want to put so much time and energy into making sure we can get together at least once a year and hopefully more than, than once a year. Because I've noticed, too, we still do the Zoom. Zooms are great. Uh, you know, obviously, I would I would much rather have Zooms than go back to phone calls. Um Oh, yeah. But the Zooms are that much more productive and people are that much more engaged because we we put in the time just to hang out with each other and, you know, play Jenga and eat pizza together. You get to know someone at a more intimate level and the whole idea of board games and people in, a, you know, small groups like that feels very family to me, or at least 
intimate, right? Yeah. It's what you do with your closest friends. And you're having intimate conversations while you're being competitive at the same time. <laughs> right. This whatever game is it that, that you're playing. But that intimacy, which I think uh, COVID, you know, was a, a negative consequence of, of COVID that we weren't able to have those kinds of connections. And I agree with you completely. There is no substitute for connections. I don't care what it is, the best business model, the best product, none of that supersedes the connections uh, that we have as a franchise organization with our franchisees and franchisee to franchisee. So I, I do hope our franchisors uh, listen to this. Um, I, it's funny, I was telling you earlier, Andy, it's been four years since I've been to an IFA conference and I went last week um, once because of COVID and twice because uh, I missed because of surgeries right before and I wasn't able to walk. And I'm telling you, I left there and I was rejuvenated. Uh, those hugs, the handshaking. Occasionally, you even get a kiss on the cheek. Wow. <clears throat> you know, it's. I've been people are getting intimate. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> but I left there rejuvenated, thinking this needs to be done more often. We need each other, um, and those relationships. So. Out of that, now what happens? You're following up with each of these franchisees individually. Uh, I think you said you're doing some field visits now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we that was our final one that we had the scaling summit. From now on out for the next four or five months, it's really game time in this business. We're a seasonal business. The mosquitoes come out to play right around now, uh, and and for the rest through through the end of the summer at least, and, and in many markets into October, November. Uh, from some of our markets are even year round, but this is really the the majority of business is going to get started over the next four months. And so now it's time to put our heads down, execute. We've, we've done all the planning. We've done all the strategizing. We've put the time and energy into the relationships. Now it's time to get it done. Go to work, right? Yeah. Go to work. So um, Andy, when you look back at your life, um, can you see a theme that kind of plays through your life that shows up again and again? Uh, is it this connection thing? Is it another theme that brings in this connection thing? What is a, when you look at life, what is the thing that keeps repeating itself or is a theme in your life? Yeah, I guess it's just kind of this innate desire to to build. It wasn't something that I could articulate for a long time, but it was just something I just kind of felt within me. And, you know, I hope anybody listening to this, I hope you don't take away from this that you need to like build as well. But I think what you do need to do is really listen to who you are and try to articulate what it is that makes you tick. And aside from from family and friends, like what sort of purpose are you seeking in life? And uh, it, this sooner I could learn to articulate that for me, um, the happier I ended up being, the more satisfied I am with just life in general, uh, the more productive I feel, the more like, I'm, you know, using my the superpowers, the few superpowers that I have, you know, I, I feel like I'm using them and I feel um, feel like I'm using what I have. And anyway, so it's, it's a lot more satisfying to do it that way. And Tracy, you do this every day with your clients too. What Andy kind of backed into and discovered who he really is and how he's wired and what his true purpose is. And then he was able to express it uh, through Mosquito Hunters. What's your discovery when you're working with people and helping them find that superpower, let's call it? Yeah. You know, I, I was listening to Andy speak and um, you really have a beautiful way of summing all of that up. And I think for me, working with my clients, it's really about giving them the permission to be in their, what I call their information gathering stage. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people bypass that. They feel like, oh, well, my parents told me to do this or I'm supposed to do that. Or I was supposed to, like Andy did, go get a job in corporate. 
but they don't give themselves that permission to explore. And I think that's so vital. And then you pretty much found what I call your zone of purpose. That's your zone of purpose. And you're, you're not trying to be something you're not, and you're not venturing outside of that. Of course, everybody, we all expand and grow, but you literally found, you must have, you know, I guess, written it down or figured out exactly what makes you tick and stepped into that zone of purpose, which is a beautiful thing. And that's really where we strive to get every client. And I have to tell you, that's where I have the clients take this Oracle profile because mm-hmm. it really does help. It really does help. They like see themselves in a whole different light. It's, you know, I just have to say that, but that's, uh, yeah, I, I love what you're doing just, and I love how you're inspiring, not only your franchisees, but just prospective franchisees who are listening to this podcast, inspiring them to, you know, rethink what does happiness mean to you? What are you getting out of your career in corporate America? Is it giving back to you what you are putting into it? Or do you just think it's giving it back or are you just accepting what it's giving back? Yeah. I love that. That's really well said. I, I think part of how how I got to a point where I'm I'm happy and satisfied with the work that I'm doing too was being willing to say no. And part of I think that of learning what makes you tick is uh, feeling comfortable in your own skin and mm-hmm. saying, mm-hmm. I, I, I do like doing this, but you know what? I don't like doing that. And I'm not afraid to say that I don't like doing that. I think for a long time early in my career, I felt like I had to be all things to all people. I was worried about letting other people down. I thought that I was letting myself down if I wasn't trying to do anything. And then there's this realization moment that came over time, like, just because I can do something doesn't mean that I should do it. It doesn't mean that I want to do it. And it doesn't mean that I'm wrong because I don't want to do it. I should listen to the part of me that's telling me what I want to do and try and match that up with, with reality. Yeah. Which I think comes back to that connection thing again, because if you're gifted in a certain way and you have certain purpose in your life, then there's going to be things you're not good at and and or don't want to do, which is why our relationships and our connections are so important because others are gifted in different way and do get passionate about the very thing that we hate, right? Right. I have a bookkeeper that just thinks numbers and things like that are just the coolest thing ever. I'm just so grateful for, but this is why our relationships are so important because they, Uh, enrich our lives as we can enrich uh, theirs. Um, All right, guys, we're getting close to the top of the hour. I want to make sure I don't forget to ask Andy, if someone wants to learn more about uh, mosquito hunters, learn more about you, how would they get hold of you? A great place to start is mosquitohuntersfranchise.com. Got a lot of information on that website, mosquitohuntersfranchise.com. If you want to learn more, you can fill out a form that's on that website. That'll go to our team and we can follow up with you, give you some more information. Uh, If you want to connect with me, I'm on LinkedIn, Andy Fuller. I guess there's probably a lot of Andy Fullers, but the Andy Fuller who uh, is CEO of Mosquito Hunters, that's me. There you go. The The hunter of mosquitoes. Yes. I love it. All right. Any final thoughts, Tracy? It sounds like you really did a beautiful wrap up later, but did anything else? I know. I know. I was just thinking that it's like, other than everything we spoke about before, I'm just so, I'm so impressed with um, Andy's ability to realize, your ability to realize at a young age, what you didn't want to do when there are people Mm -hmm. who are in their forties and fifties you know, first trying to figure it out and some people never figure it out. I I want everyone to listen to this podcast and hear you. I really do. So we're, we're going to definitely uh, do our best to have as many listeners as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, just thank you for sharing your insights. I really love what you're doing. And the culture that you're building is really impeccable. It's fun. It's lively. And it's a it's a great reflection, I'm sure, of you and your team. So thank you for being our guest today. You were a wonderful guest. Well, yes. You're very kind. Th- thank you very much. You two were wonderful hosts. I appreciate you, you having me. 
We're glad you could join us. And the rest of you listening in today to the Franchise Woman podcast, where passion and purpose collide, profits are made, and relationships forged are focused today, obviously, on the combination of passion and relationships. And Andy's been great at articulating that. So we'll see you next week for another episode.